Vasato ma sadgamaya Tamaso ma jyotir gamaya Mrityur ma amritam gamaya Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat O Lord, lead us from the untruth to the true. Lead us from darkness unto light. Lead us from death to immortality. Om, peace, peace, peace. Lead us from death to immortality. That is the theme for Easter. And that is the theme we have this morning. Victory over death. You know, I initially thought I would speak about the Kato Upanishad. And then um, I saw this is Easter. So maybe I would have to speak about Easter. But then I saw they are virtually the same subject. <laughs> Kato Upanishad and Easter, both are victory over death. Here we all are this beautiful Sunday morning. Life goes on. And yet for all of us, from all our diverse backgrounds, our diverse life histories, our diverse aims in life, all of us, and indeed all beings on living on this planet today, we have one common <coughs> certainty, inescapable truth before us. That is death. Swami Vivekananda puts it in his inimitable, forceful way. Everybody dies. Kings die and paupers die. Sages die and fools die. The most spiritual of persons have died. Physically at least, Jesus died. Ramakrishna, Krishna, Rama, Buddha, they all died. The greatest of sages die. The most common person also dies. The longest lived of all creatures, they also die one day. Hindus have um, conceptions of not one heaven but seven heavens. And uh, beings, divine beings live for millennia there. But they die too, even the gods die. Gods with a, with a small g. So death is an inescapable certainty that we all face. The Psalms, Book of Psalms, what man can live and not face death? Who can deliver his soul from the power of Sheol? Sheol is old, an old biblical term. It means exactly the Sanskrit Yama, the Lord of Death, the, the land of death. Who can live and escape the land of death? So Sheol is the land of death, Yama. Bhagavad Gita. Come forward. You can, you can come here. There's, there's space here. Yeah. Bhagavad Gita. Jatasya hi dhruvo mrittu. To be born is a, is, a, there is a certain fate, and that is inescapable fate. Dhruvo, certain, is death for the one who is born. So the Buddhists, in their um, typical put downer way, <laughs> And they are, they are absolute realists. They say every birthday is one year closer to the end. Hmm? <laughs> Birth is just the beginning of the end. So, anityam, sarvam anityam, everything is transient. Come forward, we have space here. Please come, don't stand. We have space. There's this book. The denial of death. I don't know if um, some of you must have heard about it. It's, it's a very well-known book. In 1974, it won the Pulitzer Prize. Professor Ernest Becker, sociologist, he wrote this book, The Denial of Death. Powerful book. One should read it. Or on second thoughts, don't read it. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> 
It's going. To, it's to guaranteed to make you unhappy. <laughs> In that book, Professor Becker himself died the same year he got the uh, Pulitzer Prize. This very year it was published. It's quite touching. The the editor of Psychology Today, who reviewed the book, uh, he asked for an interview with the author, Professor Becker, and he was told that Professor Becker is terminally ill with cancer and has got one week to live. live. And he got an interview. And both the person who was interviewing and the person who was being interviewed, they knew that, that uh, Professor Becker, the patient, would not live to see the publication of that interview. <laughs> the denial of death. And there he shows that the fear of death is the most pervasive power in our lives. The most pervasive power. We may say, no, I don't really think about death. Some very morbid people might, some philosophers might, some poets might, but I don't think about death. And Professor Becker shows how we do not think about death, that's true. As Montaigne wrote, that uh, the peasant in the field is unconcerned about death. You may say that he is because he is stupid, then Montaigne writes, then we should learn from that kind of stupidity. And Professor Becker says, today we would call it repression. We won't call it stupidity, we'd call it repression. He shows that the fear of death is all pervasive in our lives, but, but it's also true that we do not think about death because we deny it. We turn our face away from it, and that's a great blessing. He also acknowledges that life could not go on but for that denial, but for that repression. How is it that it pervades our life? Just look at every activity of the organism, not just us, all living beings. Look at every activity. The most, the greatest amount of energy and time and effort is spent in self-preservation. In eating, in, in shelter, in medicine, not just physical self-preservation. In, in the case of human beings like us, we have a social self-preservation. Our status in life, oh. our um, relationships with people, and all these activities at self-preservation. And Professor Becker, with unpleasant cleverness, points out, why would we work so hard at preserving ourselves unless we were aware of forces which are aiming towards self-disintegration. There is something in this nature, in this world, which is, which is always threatening to destroy us. Not explicitly, but we are aware. How careful we are, how worried we become if there's a chance of missing a meal. How worried we become if there's a slight cut, a little wound in the body. How worried we become if somebody next, you know, sneezes, what does he have? <laughs> Am I going to get it too? Why are we so worried? Why are we so worried? It's very natural. We think it's very natural. Naturally I'm worried, but why? Because there is this ever-present threat of self-disintegration. And we are always struggling to preserve ourselves. And he shows that one after another. He says we have these immortality projects. He calls them immortality projects. He calls them heroism. It might be high heroism. He calls it high heroism of the patriot who wants to give up his or her life for the country so that he or she may live on in the larger society in the country. It's, it's the high heroism of the business tycoon who builds up an enormous business empire. It might be the ordinary, he calls it the ordinary heroism of the family man who struggles to keep his family together and takes pride in a family spanning three generations, myself and children and grandchildren. And all of that he calls immortality projects. They are all struggle against the inevitability of death, of the darkness, of the final darkness. The denial of death. We deny it and yet we cannot truly deny it. That is the nature of repression. Thanks to Freud, we know, Freud in the United States itself, he gave a series of lectures towards the end of his life and he was asked in a classroom, uh, how do you, could you explain this whole business of repression to us, what happens? And it was a classroom. So he gave a famous, now famous example. He said, suppose there are some unruly students in the classroom 
and we, the professor asks those students to leave the classroom. And they do leave the classroom, he turns them out, but they don't go away. Those kids are outside the door, you cannot see them, but they bang on the door and they rattle the windows and we peep in through this way and that way. So that which we repress, the forces and thoughts and instincts and fears which we repress, they do not go away. They rattle the cage of this unconscious. We feel it. They guide our lives. They force us into strange pathways in life. They are always there. They haunt us. It's that unseen wolf of death which nips ever at our, our, at our ankles. We do not see it. It hounds us throughout life. He quotes William James, Professor William James, who puts it so beautifully and, <laughs> and uh, morbidly too. He says, at this banquet of life, the joyous festive banquet of life, there is ever the grinning skull at the ta table. We look away from it. We don't want to look at it. It's there. At every table, in every feast and every banquet, it's there. The grinning, he calls it the grinning skull. It pervades our life. Kato Upanishad is about that. Yama, the lord of death, and his, the one who is interviewing him, the little boy Nachiketa, whom I let, I'd like to think of as the first Vedanta student, you know, our <coughs> predecessor. We are all in the line of Nachiketa. And Yama offers him temptations. Now, in, in the, with the context of Professor Becker's denial of death, we can understand those temptations. He offers him, you want a long life, Nachiketa? Don't ask me about immortality, about the soul, about the secret of death. You want a long life? You want children and grand... Literally, I'm literally translating from the Upanishad. Do you want to have a long life with your children and grandchildren? Do you want to be a king? Do you want to be very rich? Do you want to enjoy all pleasures of heaven and earth? Not only earthly pleasures. Those pleasures which are impossible for, for the mortal frame to bear also. To, to even, even imagine. Those I offer you. A life of pleasure. A life of fulfilling relationships, a long life, a life of power, a life of acquisition and richness, immortality projects, all of them. And Nachiketa's answer is very direct. He says, he has three points to make. One is that uh, as long as you are there, O oh death, all of this is meaningless. Because I may get all of it, but the day I die, it's all gone. At that point, point, it would be like not having any of it at all. And the other point he makes, of course, is there's a limit to what we can enjoy. As Somerset Mom says, if you pursue pleasure single-mindedly, very soon you find nothing pleasing anymore. So he points that out. And the third point is the spiritual quest. I want the answer to my question. And he answers, and he says very cheekily, after all, he's a kid. So he says, he thumbs his nose at, um, he, what, what's the expression? He thumbs his, yeah, at, at Yama. He says, Tavaiva vaha tava nitya gite. Thou can keep thy chariots and song and dance. You can keep it. You have your fun and your riches and your pleasures. You, you keep it. I want the answer to my question. So all these immortality projects, they are bound to fail. They are bound to fail. Nobody has succeeded. As, as the book of Psalms says, um, who can preserve himself from the power of Sheol, or the power of Yama, power of, of death. Later on in the Bible we find, who can, what man lives who can add an hour to his days? Not even one hour we can add. Jesus, we know, after the crucifixion, uh, crucifixion, he was buried and the powers that we were very careful about keeping his body away from the disciples because they were afraid of trouble being created by the disciples. And uh, on the third day, that's today, 
Mary Magdalene. She went to the tomb where Jesus had been buried. And this is from Matthew. The, the whole uh, account is, which I'm giving you now is from Matthew. She went there and she um, saw something interesting. As she approached the tomb, there was an earthquake. And it shook. Everything shook. And an amazing creature, an angel of the Lord, descended from the skies. The description in Matthew is, uh, is thrilling. He looked like lightning. The angel looked like lightning. And his dress was all white. And he descended from the sky. And the account is very interesting. He came to the tomb of Jesus and Mary was watching. He came to the tomb of Jesus and this amazing creature... Today we would call it a UFO sighting or something like that, you know. <laughs> this amazing creature, he came and sat down on the tombstone. And it had been opened, the tomb was open. And the angel spoke to Mary, saying that, I know you come looking for Jesus who laid here, but he is not here anymore. He has risen. The Christ has risen. And you go to Galilee, tell others, you will find him there. And the angel disappeared. Mary rushed, told the other disciples. On the way, she, she actually saw Jesus. The disciples saw Jesus in the flesh. Actually, Jesus was there. That was, that's the account. And they fell at his feet and they worshipped him. And he said, all of you come to Galilee. I shall speak to you there. So this is the story of the resurrection of Christ. What is the meaning of this? In traditional Christian theology, this is central. I heard a Christian preacher saying that without this event, the whole of Christianity becomes meaningless. In fact, this is the crucial point, you know, where religion offers a solution, not another immortality project, but a genuine solution to the problem of death, the only solution. The Upanishads, Swami Vivekananda loved to quote this one. Shrinvantu Vishve Amritasya Putraha. Listen, ye children of immortal bliss. We are mortal. And the, the Upanishadic sage calls us children of immortal bliss. Aye dhamani divyani tastu. And if there are gods in higher heavens, you also listen. Because what I'm going to say, you do not know. This is something new. You can come here, there is space here. What I am going to say, you do not know. Vedaham Purusham Mahantam. I have known that infinite being. What kind of infinite being? Aditya Varnam. Tamasaf Parastat. Blazing forth like the sun. Forever beyond darkness. Tameva Viditva Ati Mrityumeti. Having known that, here is the crucial line. One goes beyond death. Atimrityumeti, one transcends death. One goes to the further shore of our mortal world. One transcends death. This is a Bengali poet who sings that tired after life's journey, I come to thy shores. What shall I see there? Will the boat that takes us across, across the ocean of life, will that boat be there or the boat will not be there? If the boat is not there, what shall I, what, what should I, what should I think? Is it all false? <coughs> will the boat be there, which will take me across to this, across this ocean of mortality, to the further shore of immortal bliss? Ati mrityu meiti, nanya pantha vidyati ayanaya. The Upanishadic sages they say we don't know who said it thousands of years ago, at the very least by conservative estimates four to five. 40 to 50 centuries ago, 4 to 5,000 years ago. Nanya pantha vidyate ayanaya. It means there is no other way. No immortality project is going to help. Neither family, nor business empires, nor political empires, nor science, nor art. Nothing. Nothing is going to give you the immortality which you, are, which you seek. Nothing is going to deliver you from that hound of death which forever you know, snaps at your ankles. Except this. 
that there is an infinite reality, realize that and you shall be free of death. Jesus, in the book of John, he explains this further. Martha and Mary, there, um, we have space here, you can come here. Martha and Mary, their uh, brother had died, and whom Lazarus, whom Jesus loved very much, and Martha asked Jesus to help them. If you were here, my brother wouldn't have died, O oh Lord. And even now, she says, look at the faith. Even now, if you ask God, God will make uh, this child live, this young boy live. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Jesus said, he explains, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. It's beautifully put. We shall explore the, uh, the profound nature. You can come here. There's space here. We can explore the profound nature of this. He says two things. That those who take refuge in me, believe in me, they die, and yet they are not dying. They, 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 are, they will still live. And those who are living, while living, if they believe in me, if they take refuge in me, they shall never die. And he says to Martha, do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, he who is coming into this world. I'm reminded of uh, Kalipada Ghosh a very well-to-do gentleman of Calcutta who was um, rather fond of, of the spirit, the other kind of spirit, no, not, not spirituality. He was spiritual, but in another sense. He, he, he could be a poster boy for Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. <laughs> and when he first came to Sri Ramakrishna, his friend Girish Ghosh bought him. Um, when he first came to Sri Ramakrishna, he was at that first meeting itself, he was, a slightly, he was slightly drunk. And he came and the first question he asked Sri Ramakrishna was not like Narendra Nath, Sir, have you seen God? You know, Vivekananda. He asked, do you have anything to drink? <laughs> and all the people, the devotees and people sitting around, they were embarrassed by, like, by this. They did not like him coming to Sri Ramakrishna because they were people from good society and uh, they looked down upon and, and it is a holy situation where uh, talk of God is going on and this person is just not fitting in. But Sri Ramakrishna got along like a house on fire with Kalipada Ghosh. <laughs> Sir, do you, have, do you have anything to drink? Sri Ramakrishna said, yes, I have. But what I have, the wine that I have, if you taste that, you will forget all other kinds of wine. And then Kalipada Ghosh says, why, is it English wine? <laughs> British, you know that the British were ruling India at that time. Is it British, English wine? And Sri Ramakrishna, others, you could see others, you know, they, their faces must have turned red with embarrassment. Sri Ramakrishna says, not at all. He used this word, deshi. It is entirely local in <laughs> Indian. <laughs> I can give it, will you give me some of that? He said, I can give it to you but then you will lose everything else. You will lose taste for everything else. And you can see it's something, there's a, the subtext is divine. Kalipada goes, you know, he folds his hands and in tears he said, the Lord, I, I, my Lord, I beg you to give me some of that. Give me that, that's, that's what I want. And anyway, the point of this story, why I said this, how he started coming and then he became a devotee and um, Quite some time later, here's the point, why I brought up Kalipada Ghosh. You see, how does the incarnation of God, Jesus, Ramakrishna, Krishna, and others, how do they take us across death, the ocean of death? Kalipada Ghosh, one day, he comes to Dakshineshwar, where Sri Ramakrishna is to stay, on the river Ganges. And Kalipada Ghosh came in a boat. Sri Ramakrishna was getting ready to go to the city of Calcutta to, to give, a, give a talk, maybe. 
And uh, Kalipada Ghosh said, Sir, I have got my boat. You can come with me. You don't have to go by a carriage and cross the bridge. I'll take you across on my boat. Sri Ramakrishna says, Yes. All right, I'll go. He's innocent, childlike. He didn't know what Kalipada Ghosh had got up, up his sleeve. So he got into the boat and Kalipada Ghosh ordered the boat to be taken to, the, to midstream in the middle of the river. It's a big river. In the middle of the river, he stopped the boat. He ordered the boat to be stopped. Sri Ramakrishna said, what are you doing? He said, no, we shall not go any further until you give me what I want. <laughs> Sri Ramakrishna is flustered. He said, what is all this? What do you want? I want your grace. And Sri Ramakrishna said, yes, 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 it's all right. Well, I, I bless you and let's go now. He said, no, I want your grace. And then Sri Ramakrishna, imagine, the incarnation of God. It's like Jesus in front of you. And Sri Ramakrishna says, here, I give you the mantra. Initiated him. Kalipada Ghosh says, no. He takes, takes the initiation, doesn't refuse it. He takes it. But then he says, no, I want your grace. Sri Ramakrishna says, what more do you want? I want your grace. And we shall not go any further until you, you are gracious. And then Sri Ramakrishna says, see, if you force God, you don't know how far he will go. He says, next, you don't have to repeat the mantra also. It will happen by itself. Your enlightenment, your freedom, you will be delivered by, by itself. You don't have to do anything. And Kalipada Ghosh says, no. I want your grace. And Sri Ramakrishna is completely bewildered. What more can he give? He is giving salvation, freedom, at no cost. <laughs> there are no hidden fees. I was flying by Southwest this time and they, they advertised, we have no hidden fees. <laughs> there are no, no hidden fees. It's freedom. You don't even have to do sadhana. And it's guaranteed by God himself, no less. And Kali Padakho still says no. And the next part is, I, I, I mean, it's really profound and touching. Then Sri Ramakrishna you know, sort of exasperated and rattled. You know. Sri Ramakrishna says, what do you want? Tell me. Then Kali Padakho says, my Lord, the day I die, it will be dark. My relatives, nobody will be around me at that time. He's narrating so vividly. I'm sure he had a dream or something. How did he know all this? He says, it'll be dark. I shall lie alone. There'll be none next to me. Nobody around me. Promise me that you will come. And then he describes. That's very interesting. He says, in your left hand, there'll be a light. And in the darkness, you will come. With your right hand, you will hold me. Take my hand and lead me into the darkness. That's what I want. I don't know. He must have had some dream. Otherwise, how so particular and how so detailed and everything. And Sri Ramakrishna said, all right, all right, that's all right. Let's go now. And Kalipada Ghosh immediately said, okay, let's go. He's got what he wants. And when he passed away, there's a clear description. Uh, by one of the swamis who had gone to visit him. And it is true that he was surrounded by all his relatives. He was a big man with a big family and everything. At that moment, when he passed away, strangely enough, people had gone. Maybe they thought the swami was there, so it's all right, and he's not doing too badly. We can go and take rest or whatever. And so everybody had left his deathbed, and he was there alone. And the swami was there, the one who writes this. He says, suddenly Kalipada Ghosh said, my Lord, you have come. You have not forgotten me. So many years after Sri Ramakrishna himself, Mahasamadhi, many, many years, decades later. And he says, Sri Ramakrishna has come. The Holy Mother has come. Swami Vivekananda has come. Put the seats, asana, the mats on which they sit. And he passed away. Now, the avatar, the Shastras say, the Lord comes. Sometimes he comes in the form of the Guru. Sometimes the form of the Guru. Today is Swami Yogananda's birthday. He was a direct disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, one of the first monastic disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. He was born this day. And I wanted to read how he passed away. It seems towards the end of his life, he passed away before Swami Vivekananda, I think in 1899. And um, before he passed away, 
he was ill, sick, and physically uh, broken down. Of course, full of devotion for Sri Ramakrishna. And one day, he had a vision of Sri Ramakrishna. And he prayed to Sri Ramakrishna that let this life be my last life. I do not want to come back. Give me moksha, freedom from birth and death. And Sri Ramakrishna said, you have to come again. Come again, not in the sense like we come because they are fully illumined souls. But for the welfare, for our welfare. You know, when the, when the incarnation comes, a group of, um, uh, of his helpers, uh, Ishwara Koti, they, 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 they come with him. And Yoganandaji was one of them. And Yogananda refused. He said, no, I will not come again. Let me go this time. And Sri Ramakrishna disappeared. Neither Yogananda would give in, nor Sri Ramakrishna would give in. Sri Ramakrishna already had, uh, had passed away by that time, Mahasamadhi. And then I think another of the direct disciples, probably, probably Swami Brahmananda, said, why do you disobey the, the Master? If the Master wants you to come again, definitely be with him again. And another play of the divine incarnation. So obey the Master, agree to his wishes. So um, Yogananda finally gave in. He said, let the will of the Lord be done. If he wishes me to come again, I shall come with him again. After that, he passed away. A few days later, I think Swami Shivananda was with him in the last days, last moment. And he asked Yogananda, who was fading fast, do you remember the master? Do you remember Sri Ramakrishna? And Yogananda said, yes, much more than ever before. He was probably afraid by whether the Swami is losing consciousness, losing memory. He says, much more than ever before. I am full of the Lord now. And he passed away. So the Lord mediates our transition from this life to the next. This is what Jesus meant when he said that those who die, if they take refuge in me, at the point of death, they shall live, they shall not die. Those who have died, they shall live, he says. This in Vedantic terminology, this is called videha mukti. At the point of death, they are released forever from the bondage of life and death. And the other one, he says, yet while living, those who take refuge in me, they shall not die. In Vedantic terminology, this is called jivan mukti. In living, already in the, we are in this life, the body has not yet perished, we are still living. And you get enlightenment. You realize what you are. Now the question is, all this is fine, well and good. But how is it that uh, mortal man becomes immortal? How does that work? We may be emotional and we, t we may be moved by the stories of Kalipada Ghosh and, uh, and Lazarus. Um, and Martha and Mary and, and Jesus and Ramakrishna, all that's wonderful. And probably that's all that, that kind of faith is all that is necessary for liberation and for um, immortality. But how does it work? What exactly is it that happens? That was the question that the little boy Nachiketa had when he asked Yama. He asked this question. He said that Yama gave him three boons. The Lord of Death gave the little boy three boons. You can ask for three things. And Nachiketa, first, he asked for something a little boy will ask because his father had banished him from home. So Nachiketa naturally so he said that first thing, let my dad not be mad at me anymore. A very intelligent boy. He said, when I go back home, my dad should recognize me and should not be mad, with me anymore, mad at me anymore. Nobody goes back from the land of death. Nobody has as yet. And that's not what Nachiketa asked. He didn't ask that I should go back, I should live again. He took it for granted. He was a very cool kid, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'll go back, I'll go back. I, I'm dead now, but I'll again I'll live. Of, of course you'll send me back home. So um, that's all right, but my dad should like me. He shouldn't be mad at me anymore. So that was the first thing. If you know the story, that makes sense. And that's a very uh, a nice touch to the story. The second thing was conventional religion. In those days, religion was these huge fire sacrifices complicated fire sacrifices that the Vedic people used to believe in. And he says, teach me the best fire sacrifice. And Yama, the Lord of Death, teaches him the best fire sacrifice. And so pleased with this little boy, the Lord of Death says, from now on, this fire sacrifice will be called Nachiketa Yajna. It will be called by your name after you. 
but all that is secondary. The third question is most important. Nachiketa asks, some say, this is what I really want to know, some say, after death we are. Some say, after death we are not. What is the truth about this, I would like to know. Essentially, he's not asking whether we exist after death or not, that's secondary, because he belonged to a religious culture where people did believe that people existed after death, and they went to different uh, planes. That's why he asked for the fire sacrifice, how do I go to heaven, all those things. But what he was asking about was the nature of the soul. He was basically asking, who am I? What am I? What is this mystery of life? What am I? Body is born, body will die. The Gita says, Jatasya hi dhruva mrityu, dhruvam janma mritasya cha. It is certain that the, those who are born shall die. But it is equally certain that those who die shall be reborn. There's this cartoon where <laughs> Christian says to a Hindu, I am a born again Christian. And the Hindu says, I am a born again and again and again and again Hindu. <laughs> So the problem is not that whether um, we will come again or not. The problem is that we, we die again and again and again. And we repeat this futile drama of this life in, various, in variations again and again and again. It's this life repeated ad infinitum. Swami Madhavanandaji, who was the president of the order many, many decades ago in the 1960s, and he had come to the United States in New York for an operation, a brain operation. He had a tumor in the brain. And he was being nursed there so that he would recover. And one day there's this very senior Swami, he was Madhavanandaji, he was sitting in the room nearby and this uh, group of American devotees were sitting there. They were discussing the latest innovation. The birth control pill had been invented and it was creating a lot of debate in society in the 60s or 70s, 60s, in the 60s, early 60s. And there were people for it, there were people against it, and so on. They were discussing this, whether it uh, should support it or be against it. And they, of course, they thought that Swami shouldn't hear this discussion because it's something, definitely, he will not be interested in this. And the Swami, from the distance, he says, I support it. <laughs> and then they just looked, oh, Swami, you have a position on this? And the Swami said, yes, my position is, I am against birth and against death. <laughs> no birth and no death. And when Swami Vivekananda in the 19th century, when the late 19th century, when he was even in this country, the idea was religion is meant to go, for us to go to heaven. That's the purpose of religion. It's like the conventional religion of the Vedic times, which Nachiketa talked about with Yama, that how can we go to heaven? That was the, the purpose of religion, or conventional religion. And that's what people thought in this country too. And Swami Vivekananda used to deliver these shockers. He would say, I have not come here to teach you how to go to heaven. I have come here to teach you how to stop going to heaven. Um, this gentleman who was with him in a train, and he said, uh, well, you, you are definitely going to hell. And Swami said, uh, what about you? He said, I'm going to heaven. And Swami said, all right, then I prefer going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> what happens? By knowing that infinite reality, an infinite consciousness, one becomes immortal. By believing in the Christ, by taking refuge in Ramakrishna, one goes beyond mortality. But how? By knowing something, by believing something, you do not become that. All right, I understand, as Martha said to Jesus, that I believe thou art the Son of God. So thou art immortal. But believing in that, knowing that, does not make me immortal. If you know something, do you become that? You do not. That would be a terrible thing. If, if, you, if I know this book, I see this book and I become a book, then it doesn't happen, luckily. <laughs> but it says, one who realizes Brahman, one who knows Brahman, becomes Brahman. Brahma Veda Brahmaiva Bhavati. The knower of Brahman becomes Brahman. The knower of God becomes immortal. How? There is only one case. There is only one possibility, one case, in which if you know something, you become that. Only one case. What is that case? 
It is when you are already that, when we are already that, but somehow we don't know it, we have forgotten it, we are ignorant about it. Swami Vivekananda used to tell us the story about the lioness who gave birth to a little cub, a lion cub who was brought up by sheep and thought it was a lamb, a sheep. And one day, and it grew up a big lion, but it used to eat grass and move around with its sheep friends. And one day another lion was stalking this herd and saw this big lion, young lion among all these sheep and eating grass and was puzzled. So he went and caught hold of that lion and the lion bleated, no, no, let me go, let me go, I'm scared, you're scaring me. And the lion said, no, you come with me. Why are you doing this? You are not, you are not one of them. You are like me, a lion. He said, no, no, I'm not like you, you terrify me. <laughs> then the lion showed his face in, the, in a pool of water and showed his own face, look at that. Roar like me. And the lion roared and made that other lion roar too and he realized that he was a lion. But how did the sheep become a lion? Only because it was already a lion. It did not know that it was a lion. Swami Vivekananda says, that's what we are. We are existence consciousness bliss. We are that infinite reality. We are nothing other than the very substance of God. The Godhead itself. Clothed in mind, clothed in flesh. Limited by our minds and our bodies. We are immortal consciousness. Yama, the Lord of Death, tells Nachiketa in the Katha Upanishad. He says, Yadeveha tadamutra, yadamutra tadanviha. He says to Nachiketa, that which is here, here means this little boy Nachiketa and all other little boys and little children and grown up people and plants and animals and all living creatures, that which is here, the embodied consciousness is there too. There means that infinite consciousness you call God. That which is there, that infinite consciousness is here too. He says this. And then he gives a warning. Mrityu samrityu gachati. She says, Mrityu samrityu maapnoti yaiha nani vapashyati. The one who sees the slightest difference between himself or herself and God, who sees the slightest difference, goes from death to death. <coughs> Yama is harsh. He does not say, it could have just as easily said, he goes from birth to birth. <laughs> His birth is a little more pleasant. He says, no, he goes from death to death. It's exactly the same. He goes from death to death. Mrityu sa mrityu maapnoti. He attains death after death, who sees the slightest difference between himself or herself and God and the Lord. You are one and the same. As, uh, I think it was, Emerson who said that there are people who claim to be fond of, um, of not Emerson, the, the humorist, um, Mark Twain, Mark Twain. He said, there are those, I've seen that those who claim to be fond of the brutal truth are usually more fond of brutality than the truth. <laughs> so Yama is a little bit fond of the brutal truth and he says, attain fr death after death. One goes from death to death, one who sees the slightest difference between oneself and God. A tremendous statement. This is a Mahavakya, not one of the conventional Mahavakyas. What is a Mahavakya? The Sanskrit meaning, term means the great sentence. A single sentence which, compri which compresses the entire teaching of the Vedanta, of all the Upanishads, into one sentence. It's something that you can take away. Your take away from this talk is that one sentence. And the most famous one, Swami Vivekananda said it so many times in this country and everywhere and we all know about it. That thou art. Tat tvamasi. That thou art. You are that. That what? That stands for God. Tat sat in Chandogya Upanishad if we see. You are that. So this is the Mahavakya, the great sentence which compresses the entire Upanishadic wisdom into three words. Tat Tvam Asi, that thou art. And in, by convention we have four Mahavakyas, one from each Veda. But any sentence, technically speaking, by definition, any Vedic sentence which tells us the identity of man and God, of the mortal and the immortal, the essential identity of the two, any sentence which tells us that is a Mahavakya, is a great sentence. And this is a Mahavakya. 
That which is here is there too. That which is there is here too. It's a tremendous statement. It not only tells us that we are essentially God, but it also tells us God is essentially us. You are nothing other than God. You are not a body, which means you are not a body. That is why Shankaracharya, you are not even the mind. I am this, this person, man, woman, body. Happy or sad, mind. Identity, mind. Education, lack of it, mind. None of these. The consciousness, unchanging consciousness which we are, witness of the body and mind, distinct from the three bodies, the gross body, the subtle body and the causal body, distinct from the five sheets, the annamaya kosha, food sheet, the pranamaya kosha, the sheet of vital forces, the manomaya kosha, the sheet of the mind, memories, perceptions, the sheet of the intellect, vijnanamaya kosha, the sheet beyond that, the anandamaya kosha, the sheet of bliss and ignorance. Beyond these five sheets, beyond the three bodies, the witness of the three states, waking, dreaming, deep sleep, which we cycle through every day. Not only us, every creature. Did you know ants sleep? <laughs> they do. I, I didn't know that. I sort of, nowadays you can Google it, so you, I Googled it. They not only sleep, they dream. They have little ant dreams. <laughs> Yes, like we have a REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, that's, that, that's equivalent to dream. People are supposed to be dreaming when this REM is going on, rapid eye movement. They have a REM sleep, rapid antenna movement sleep. <laughs> and it's, a, it's not even a theory, it's a pro, I mean, uh, they have full papers on it, it's available on the net. We cycle through this waking, dreaming and deep sleep every day. And we are not any of these. We are not the identity which you have right now. We are not the identity which we have in dreams. We are not the blankness of deep sleep also. We are the witness which watches these three states come and go. Avasthatraya vilakshana, to use the Sanskrit word. Apart from witnessing the three stages, three, three states of consciousness, three states of our mind, waking, dreaming and deep sleep. Pancha kosha vilakshana, apart from the five sheets, which make up the human personality. Dehatraya Sakshi, the witness of the three bodies. That which is here is there too. That's why Shankaracharya sings. You know, when he says, we, all, we have all heard that, Chidananda Rupa Shivoham, I am, a, I am bliss, I am consciousness, I am Shiva. But before he says that, if you see the lines before that, Mano buddhi hankara chittani naham. I am not the mind, I am not the intellect, I am not the memory, I am not even the I. How paradoxical is that? Ahankara naham. I am not the I sense, the ego too. I am the witness of the I. I am not the five koshas. I am not the body made of five elements. Then only I can say, I am existence consciousness bliss. That's one side of it. When, when I say we are God, it immediately means not in the sense that we are body or mind, not in that sense, apart from that, witness of that, the ground of that. And God is us. What would that mean? Apart from the essence that which you are or I am, there is no Brahma, Vishnu, Maheshwara, Father in heaven, Allah, no. The essence of what we are is also God. When we search for what we are, we find God. When we search for God, we find what we are. And Yama says to Nachiketa, he says, beautiful, poetic, poetic. Angushta matra purusha madhyatma nitishtati ishanam bhuta bhavyasya natato vijugupsate etadvaitat. How profound, especially in our context today. He says, Meditate upon yourself, the true spirit which you are in the middle of your bodies, in the heart, Angushta Matra Purusha, about this size. Wait a minute, I thought you said I was infinite. Now you are saying yeah, as big as the thumb. In the space, this much is the space in the heart. In that, you meditate upon yourself as pure consciousness. 
This consciousness which is within you or within me, what is it? He says, Ishanam Bhuta Bhavyasya. That consciousness is the Lord of the past and the present and the future. Who is the Lord of the past, present and future? God. What is the consciousness inside us now? We say, that's me. Me and God are the same. Etadvaitat. This is what, what you asked for, O Nachiketa. Yama says to Nachiketa, this is exactly what you asked for. The nature of the self. And there is a very interesting addition. Yama says that to Nachiketa. Natato vijugupsate. He does not seek to protect himself from death anymore. An end to all our endless immortality projects. Dr. Becker would have been happy. <laughs> he does not seek to protect himself anymore. He knows. He knows that he is secure. He knows that nothing in the world can kill him. Nothing in the world can destroy him. God cannot destroy him. He knows that. This is the goal of spirituality. Wittgenstein. He said the purpose of religion is absolute security. He said why people want religion? At the core of religion is a search for absolute safety, for security. Why is the person who is enlightened, why is that person so full of joy? In the Vedantic text Panchadashi we find because Praptavya Kritataya, Praptavya Praptataya, Gyatavya Gyatataya. What does it mean? Imagine what one can do in human life. Anything that one can do in human life. Imagine having the sense of done what one has to do in life. It's done. Praptavya Praptataya. Imagine having the sense of having got what one has to get in life. The one thing one has to get in life, you've got it. Gyatavya Gyatataya. Imagine knowing the one thing that has to be known in life. You've known it. After that, imagine the joy and the peace and the bliss. Things will keep happening after that. The law of karma operates, the body, the, the world will go, uh, go on as it is, the body will age and eventually succumb to disease and die. You are absolutely unconcerned about it, untouched by it. Mm. The Gita says, settled in that, the greatest of sorrows cannot shake him. Na dukkhena guruna api vichalyate. The greatest of sorrows cannot shake, shake, shake such a person. Sri Ramakrishna dying of cancer. And somebody asks him, Turiyananda ji, how are you today, sir? He says, this hurts and I cannot eat and I'm sick. And Turiyananda ji says, but I see that you are in great bliss. And Sri Ramakrishna bursts out in laughter and says, the rascal has caught me out. <laughs> He's found me out. I am caught. There's one side, the play of life goes on, but we are aware of the undisturbed depths. The ocean, Pacific Ocean here, is a beautiful example. There are storms on the surface. There are waves and there is surf and there is rain and everything. And we see that. Sometimes we see it is calm, sometimes we see it is wavy and stormy. But all the time, there is 20,000 feet of undisturbed calm water beneath. We don't know that. We see the surface. This shows us the depth. The depth of our own beings. Etadvaitat. Yama says to Najiketa, this is what you asked for. And, and he says, Angushtamatra purusha jyoti riva adhumaka. I like this language. What are we like? You are like a flame without smoke. In your heart, conceive of yourself as a flame without smoke. Consciousness. Smoke, thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, preconceived notions, limiting factors. I am this so and so. Without smoke, a flame without smoke. Jyoti Riva Adhumaka. Who is that? That's you. Ishana Bhuta Bhavyasya. That is God, the, the, the master of time, of the past and the present and the future. And then he adds, Sau Adya, Saeva Adya, Sau Shwa. That consciousness is here today and he is here tomorrow. 
He is today and he is tomorrow. That is today and that is tomorrow. So, what it means is, the commentator says, it is immortal. That which was, which is, will be tomorrow. Body will not be there tomorrow. It's interesting. As I was reading, Swami Yogananda was born today. 27th March by our calendar today. And I was reading his life. He passed away on 28th March. Of course, years later. But literally speaking, today and tomorrow. 27th March and 28th March. The body will perish tomorrow. And here Yama says to Nachiketa, he is today and he shall be tomorrow. Etad vaitat. This is what you have asked for, Nachiketa. This is the core of religion. This is the core of spiritual life, spiritual practice. There is no project more worthwhile. You see, we are not doing anything except trying to escape the fear of death. We don't think so. I also didn't think so. I thought it would be okay. It's a very profound thought. But after reading that book, The Denial of Death, Becker, I begin to see now, it's not a theory. It's not a profound thought. It's not something a, in a sentence a philosopher would be proud of. He shows how it is a living fact for all of us. All our activities, never ever thinking about death, they are all prompted by death, by the fear of death. These are all immortality projects, the highest of ideals, the most commonplace of lives. All of us are struggling against the fear, fear of death, denying it, so we are not aware of what we are doing. We have repressed it. That's what he shows in that book. And religion, spirituality, the message of Easter is, there is a way. Tameva viditva ati mrityumeti. By knowing our true nature, by knowing that which is within us, you know, they say, say beautifully, that which is behind you, that which is yet, that, that which is in front of you, and that which, which is ahead of you, all of it is as nothing compared to that which is within you. Behind us, our past, present, and what will happen in the future. Something will happen. All of it is as nothing. We keep looking towards the future, young people. Back to the past, older people. And in the present, practical people. Within us, spiritual people. All that is in front and behind and in front is as nothing compared to what is within you. And we, we do not look within. That's another subject. Kato Upanishad speaks about that also. Why we do not look within and how, what can we do to look within. So the whole point of Easter, of the Kato Upanishad, of spirituality and indeed of religion, is to find a way to transcend the fear of death, to recognize our immortality and to be free and to live. Then only we can live in freedom and in joy and in peace. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat Sri Ramakrishna